Hey everybody, KMO here with a little reverb, natural. Uh, so I haven't posted in a while and my son is visiting, my youngest. We've been watching movies in the evening and I've been trying to learn Adobe Animate during the day and you know, doing my, my regular work sans videos. Uh, you know, I think that in my daily life, I spend enough time not working that I think I'm slacking off. But then my son shows up, and I have somebody to talk to, and you know, there's, there's interactions, human interactions to be had, and the day seems a lot shorter, less work is getting done, but it, it sort of puts a positive spin on my usual routine in that while I think the portions of my day when I'm not working magnify in my mind's eye, I do actually have a fair amount of work. But um, my son and I, have, we've been watching some of my favorite movies. And I don't think it's just nostalgia. It seems like the movies, at least, you know, the best of the best movies, the ones that we're still watching 30 years later, the movies from the 80s are so much better than the movies from today. And I know that's a typical old guy thing to say, but, I'm, you know, there are younger people, there are younger YouTube movie aficionados who, you know, don't have my same nostalgic attachments, and they say the same thing. That there was something very, very different about the whole Hollywood studio system back in the 80s. And, you know, the movies that we love to watch, like last night, okay, I had my son watch Alien, 1979, Ridley Scott, Alien. And then when I was, uh, I was shooting a video job, I was away, I encouraged him to watch uh, Aliens in my absence, and, you know, I turned up for the very end of that. And he agrees, my son agrees, these movies, you know, these classic movies from the 80s that I'm having him watch are so much better than just about everything that comes out today. It's amazing. Everything that comes out in the theater. I mean, we're living in the golden age of television now, so you, you can't compare a 90-minute movie from the 80s to, you know, 27 hours of your favorite, you know, series. Two, three seasons worth of a series. But, uh, yeah, the movies today, you know, with a few exceptions... But the exceptions, like one of my favorite films in recent years is Annihilation. And, you know, it's an Eric Garland film adaptation of, a, what, Matt uh, Vandermeer? Is that his, his name? Uh, I haven't read the book, but, you know, it's, it's the first of a trilogy, the, the Southern Reach trilogy. That was amazing. But, you know, I saw it in an art theater up in Hanover, New Hampshire. It didn't play anywhere where normal people would see it. And it went, you know, to streaming almost immediately. But it's an amazing film. Uh, last night... We watched Predator. What is it, 87? I think that's when it came out. And it was amazing. It was as amazing as I remember it being. But earlier in the day, we watched The Color Out of Space. It's a Nicolas Cage film. And Nicolas Cage, well, it's, it's, he stars in it. It's an adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft story. But H.P. Lovecraft stories updated to the modern day. That's a hard thing to do. In fact, H.P. Lovecraft for the screen is a hard thing to do. His prose is so, it is so grounded in his sort of pompous, you know, Anglophile literary style, which, you know, the way I describe it, it sounds like an insult, but I love it. I absolutely love it. And to update Lovecraft to the modern era, particularly, you know, so much of his New England stories what they emphasize is that the people who live away from the big cities, out in the hills, you know, out in the, the hinterlands and the, the rural villages of New England of a century ago, they were weird people. You could believe that there were weird cultists out there who were harboring or, you know, had ongoing relationships with ancient, malevolent, non-human entities. And, you know, they had cults around them. It doesn't work in the age of the smartphone. So, you know, in, in this film... There was some effect of the, the meteorite that fell and started creating, you know, decay and, and chaos in the, the vicinity of this farmstead. You know, it prevented communication, cell phone communication, basically. So people who left were not in communication with people who stay, you know, at this cursed location. But it still, it doesn't really work. And then they have to crank up the special effects to an absurd level. You know, it just, it does not match the tone or any of the imagery that would come to mind when reading a Lovecraft story. But the worst part about it for me was Nicolas Cage. I mean, the whole point of a color, the color out of space is that this meteorite falls near a farm 
And the people who live on the farm are just normal people. They're not in league with ancient evil. They're just doing their thing, you know, going about their business, trying to stay alive, trying to make a living. And everything starts to decay in this really weird and, and awful way. And what's, you know, part of what's decaying and part of what the movie is meant to show is that this fairly normal group of people descend into madness. But with Nicolas Cage, you know, the main character is basically mad from the beginning. The flavor of his madness changes over the course of the uh, of the narrative. But Nicolas Cage, you know, just on his own, just sort of like out of the box, Nicolas Cage these days comes across as nuts, you know. So he would really have to make an effort to play a character who didn't seem nuts. And as far as I can tell, Nicolas Cage has to work a lot these days because he needs the money. I mean, I don't know the details of his situation, but he's doing a lot of work. You know, somebody who had done the films he had done in the past could be kicking back and doing the Daniel Day-Lewis thing. If you like, you know, maybe, maybe if a really, truly remarkable script comes my way, I will come out of retirement and do one last project. But otherwise, I'm just going to go and make my chairs. You know, I'm just going to do woodwork. Uh, Nicolas Cage, he does a lot of work these days. And I think just his, you know, just not even trying character is Nicolas Cage and he's nuts. <laughs> so it didn't work. I mean, the film, watching the film, the middle two thirds of it were just unpleasant. I was just waiting for it to be over. I just wanted, if I weren't watching it with my son, I would have not finished it. So, you know, we watched that and then we watched Predator. <laughs> and, you know, there was a Predator movie just a couple years ago and it sucked. It was just stupid. It's like, in the 80s, it seemed that film writers and film directors understood narrative arcs. They understood character arcs. They understood character motivation. Like, if a character is going to do something later in the film, you set it up earlier in the film. You, you justify if they have some skill. You know, you justify it early. You show it early. You don't just pull stuff out of your ass as needed to make the story go because you don't want to go back and strip it down to its foundations and build it up in a coherent fashion. You've got a few ideas and scenes and you want to link them together. I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, new Star Wars, new cinematic in the theater Star Wars. My son right now is inside watching The Mandalorian. <laughs> and I want him to finish watching the series so that we can watch Disney gallery. Cause you know, they have a whole series about the making of the Mandalorian, which is amazing. So, you know, again, good stuff is happening today, but it's happening for the small screen movies, man, even before the theaters closed for pandemic movies were dead. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to go back inside, hang out with my son. Uh, I will get this posted today and I'm working on something. I'm working on animation. I can't make any promises for the, you know, super near term, but we're getting there. You know, the long-term vision, we're getting there. Talk to you soon.